It is 21 minutes to 10. Another legend, doctor, 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 because he literally has three doctorates. Chris Smith, the naked scientist. How are you doing? Morning, Kino. All the better for hearing you, but all the sadder for hearing that you will be heading off in the future. You know, you and I have known each other and first met more than a decade ago, actually in, in, in Joburg on 702. And, um, and, and we really hit it off then. And I've enjoyed every single interaction with you. And, and I wish you every success. Thank you, thank you, Chris. But don't worry, I'm going to be I'm going to be bothering you for other things. Um, you know, Sounds alarming. Uh, my other <laughs> no, my other media platform is going to need someone like you. Be, be, well, simply just just in terms of insight, because you know one of the things we're going to look at is disruption, innovation, and one of the key things we're focusing on is science. So um, you know, I might want you to make a cameo appearance here and there. I always start off looking at Chris's last week. I mean, you know, and, and what he's been up to. So what have you been up to, sir? Well, inevitably, COVID features pretty highly, doesn't it? And so we've been looking at that issue. And the, the, the really big blip on the radar screen has got to be what's going on in India, hasn't it? With a declared caseload there of 350,000 cases of coronavirus per day that they know about. But that's a massive underestimate because they're only counting cases of people who, who effectively make it to hospital. The rural communities are going to be declaring, I'd say, at least that again, if not triple that. I reckon India's probably looking at a million cases a day right now, uh, or more. And, of course, in three weeks' time, yeah. that is going to translate into a very significant number of really very ill people because the cycle time between catching this thing, catching it to become badly affected enough to end up in hospital and disabled with it or po possibly even to, to die from it takes a few weeks. So it's not over for India yet. And I know a lot of countries are trying to step up and help them, but um, our thoughts are with them. But this is this is really testimony to the fact that, uh, you know, although many countries are feeling enthusiastic towards the effect of vaccines and so on, it's a reminder and a wake up call that we're not out of this yet. And we, yeah. we do need to watch ourselves, you know, stay on our guard and help everybody everywhere to bear down yeah. on, on this thing, because the more time it spends circulating among more people, the more likely it is we'll get variants that can bypass the effects of our vaccines that we're trying to get into everybody. So it's, it's a wake up call for all of us. And we are thinking of, of the citizens of India and uh, how we can all help them. But hopefully, hopefully we will this, regard this in the, in the future as a blip in the way things will get better and we, we can get back to normality in the future. But uh, it's certainly been a sobering week in that respect. So I've been looking at that quite a lot because, of course, there are variants coming out of, of the Indian outbreak and we're picking them up. We're picking them up in a number of countries. 20 countries plus worldwide have those uh, have the India variant in them at the moment. And at the moment, we're doing the biology to try and work out how it affects the virus. So that's been very much on my mind this week. Indeed. And if that virus finds its way into other countries, you know, as you say, I mean, it could challenge some some of the vaccines that we currently have going. Um, and we just don't know yet, to be honest with you. Yeah, because, we just uh, don't. Yeah, we have, we, we, could. I mean, there's yeah. a number of explanations as to why this big resurgence has occurred in India. And one of those explanations is that, uh, that there is something about this virus that they've got there, this Indian variant B617, which is more transmissible, although we don't have evidence that is the case at the moment, more likely it is actually a public health effect, whereby there was a degree of relaxation because uh, the Indian government felt that they had weathered the storm pretty well, and they had. They had pretty low caseload and everything was going quite well. And then there was a degree of relaxation. There were mass gatherings, political rallies, mm. people getting together for those sorts of events. And that led to enormous yeah. numbers of contacts between people. And it unfortunately has, has seeded this far and wide across the country with an enormous upsurge in cases as a result. So at the moment, we are still doing the biology on that virus to work out how much of a threat it really poses in the grand scheme of things. Probably uh, my suspicion is quite a low threat because we've known about it for a number of months and it is in 20 countries and it doesn't seem to have the changes that confer an enhanced transmissibility like the variant mm. that we created in the UK and generously yes. gave to the world. And as a result of that, it, it probably is at a disadvantage compared to other variants of the virus which can spread and grow faster. Yeah. So I think that's one kind of silver lining to that cloud. Absolutely. Now, Rob in Somerset West has a question for you. Rob, good morning, sir. Morning, Tino. 
first of all, uh, just allow me to wish you well in your future career. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank right. you. Uh, Dr. Chris, something that's always intrigued me. If you take the composition of water, water consists of, as, as I understand it, two parts oxygen, one part hydrogen. And when you put them together in the form of water, it's completely and utterly incombustible. It's, it doesn't support combustion at all, as we all know. And yet if you take hydrogen and oxygen in the gaseous form, Put them together, you get a highly volatile mixture. How can you? How, how do you just? How do you explain this? Uh, what happens, Rob, is that you've got entities, elements like hydrogen and like oxygen, that have potential energy, and they're because they have potential chemical potential energy, they're inherently unstable, and they want, in inverted commas, to form other forms which are more inherently stable because they have a lower level of potential energy. Now, if something surrenders its chemical potential energy, it's got to give it out and get rid of it somehow. And it turns out that hydrogen and oxygen both can form molecules of water, H2O, where this is inherently more stable as an entity and has released some of that chemical potential energy and going from a state of instability, hydrogen and oxygen, to a state of stability, water, and the release of that energy is the explosion that happens when you burn hydrogen in the presence of oxygen. And because you've ended up with an entity, water, which has a lower chemical potential energy, it's less reactive, it wants to do stuff less willingly, and therefore you've got to work harder to make it do anything. It's more stable, and that's why we put out fires with water, but we definitely don't put out fires with hydrogen. Sure. Good. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. That's why we love him, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank so, you. thanks so much, Rob. Have a good one. Um, I mean, let's go to some of the voice notes as well. Um, Zuki, uh, no, first Jeremy says that. No, no, let's first go to Wendy. Hi there, Wendy. <laughs> good morning. Morning. I want to ask about the coronavirus vaccine. And, and how safe is it? Because there's so much conspiracy around taking this vaccine and you have all kinds of things about it changing your DNA and now it's not safe for pregnant mothers to take. And I want to know from the scientist's point of view, you know, to a layman, is it safe to take? Hi, Wendy. You're on your last point about pregnancy. In fact, regulators in a number of countries now are uh, feeling much more confident about this issue and they are recommending that women who are pregnant have the vaccine at the time at which they're advising anyone of the same age who's not pregnant to have the vaccine. In other words, if you've got a country with a policy that says 40 to 45 year olds should be having the vaccine now and there are women among that group who are pregnant, they should go and have the vaccine at the same time along with the non-pregnant women. And the reason is when they first announced the vaccines, we didn't know what their performance would be in pregnancy because we don't routinely test new drugs and medicines on pregnant women for obvious reasons. And because we don't have data on that, it's not that there's evidence of danger, it's an absence of evidence of safety that meant that people could then say, and you should go and have this vaccine. That was the initial stance. It was revised to say, if you are at high risk from coronavirus, then one should weigh up potential theoretical risk in pregnancy versus very real risk of if you catch coronavirus and you've got this underlying clinical problem. We also know from various studies that have emerged that there is an enhanced risk in pregnancy if you catch coronavirus. All complications of pregnancy are magnified. Prematurity, as in preterm birth, is a high risk. High blood pressure and eclampsia is a high risk. These can all be prevented with the vaccine, which is why regulators have changed their stance on that. And there's a lot of data now on women who have safely had the vaccine. And that's a much better position for them to be in than being exposed to coronavirus, which we now know based on a lot of data from a lot of countries. COVID infection in pregnancy does increase the risk of all the complications of pregnancy. Now, in terms of other risk factors and how safe these vaccines are or aren't. The first point is there is never a situation where there is no risk. This is an impossibility. We just have nothing in life that is risk-free. 
for, for the mere fact that you're going to a test center you've got to get in a car and drive to a test center or get on public transport and go to a, a testing a vaccination center or a pharmacy or your local doctor's surgery that's not without risk either the risk of get if you get in your car and turn the key and drive down the road your risk of having an accident it varies country by country but it's about one in a thousand your risk of having a, a, an outcome which is negative from a vaccine is about one in a million so therefore, uh, you can see there's there's a big disparity in our in our judgment of risk. So at the moment, we're comfortable based on the fact that these vaccines have gone into tens of millions of people of many different ages, creeds and cultures all around the world. And the outcomes are, by and large, excellent, shows they have a very good safety track record. And I have no hesitation whatsoever in number one, saying uh, that they're safe and everyone should have them. And number two, I've put my money where my mouth is and I've held out my arm and I've had my jab. Dr. Chris the naked scientist taking your questions. Zuki's got a question for, for Dr. Chris Smith. Let's take a listen to it. Good morning, Kino and Dr. Chris. Um, I've got a question about batteries, uh, specifically in remote controls. So when the remote control is not working, um, we often give it a couple of bashes, and then it seems to work after that. Is there something scientific to that? Um, does that force somehow give the battery life again? Or is it just a coincidence that it works afterwards? <laughs> this is Zuki. Hi, Zuki. I don't think it's entirely a coincidence, and I'll tell you why. I don't think it's got anything to do with force from your hand going in. I think what's probably happening is that the battery, when you've got a slightly clapped out battery, the potential difference, the voltage the battery is producing, is beginning to fall, and therefore the effect of any resistance in the circuit is going to become more profound and pronounced. Now, remote controls, often, because of the way we use them, we forget uh, to change the batteries regularly, and you often get nasty batteries that make the electrodes uh, corrode because the battery leaks out the stuff that's inside it. So we then sling those dead batteries out, scrape off some of the green stuff that's formed on the electrodes and put new batteries in. That means the contacts are not necessarily very good, so the resistance is a bit higher in the circuit. And as a, a battery, therefore, ends its life, it's finding it harder and harder to surmount that additional resistance. When you give the remote control a good shake, what you do is to rub the electrodes against the battery a bit, and this can help to scrape off some of the corrosion or make sure that the contact, even any oxidation on the electrodes, between the electrode and the battery is as good as possible helping to reduce the resistance in the circuit and therefore helping to get the best out of what's left of a bad job of a battery. So I think that's more likely to be the case. Another possibility is if, if you have got some slightly dodgy connections inside the remote control, it could be that by shaking it again, you help to bring the wires into slightly closer apposition and surmount any resistance that's occurred because there is a slightly dodgy connection. So two possibilities there. Okay, brilliant. Debbie in Muller Point. Hi, Debbie. Hi. Hi. My question is, um, does every child experience trauma, even if it's in a happy home, as they call it? Because we talk about childhood trauma and um, how it affects our relationships in adulthood in terms of how we interact with each other. Mm. Um, uh, this is a difficult one. I think one has to be cautious, but I mean, obviously... It, there's a difference between a child having some trauma from falling out of bed and child have a, a, ch a child growing up in, in a, a bad environment where they're subject to relentless bullying or emotional bullying, deprivation, etc. So trauma depends how you define it. Everyone needs a few knocks and scrapes to learn lessons in life, as in, you know, you do something, it has a bad outcome and you learn I shouldn't do that again. That's how we have evolved to learn. And we, we get rewards for good things and we are punished by either the environment or pain or our parents and pocket money being docked if we're bad. But it's not those short, sharp shocks that are the problem. It is, under almost all circumstances, chronic, relentless shocks that are bad. We know that individuals who are subject to chronic, unending, punishing trauma, as in emotional abuse or bullying or made to feel worthless or uh, really not looked after properly, those sorts of effects which are unending and the individual sees no escape and they see that they happen to them regardless and there's no kind of normal balance between I do a bad thing, this bad thing happens to me and I do a good thing, good things happen, that's taken away and it's the, the sensation of loss of power and control that translates into a, a situation of chronic stress for an individual 
and that has enormous psychological impact at any age actually but if you grow up in that environment it does affect the way that your brain will develop and the way therefore yep. that your outlook on life develops and that will have life-changing consequences so mark in blowberg with our final question hi mark um, hi Kino. hi dr chris hi thank you um, I read a book by Dr. David Sinclair, if I'm not mistaken, um, called Lifespan. Um, he's, a, he's, a, he's got a lab at Harvard, and he talks about um, metformin and this other tablet, uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, to help in actually reversing aging. Um, it's, it, it hasn't been they're busy with human trials with the, with the NMN, but it is available on the market, so I've, I've bought some and I'm taking it. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that or if you know anything about that. Um, Mark, I would first of all say to everybody, be very cautious about reading something and then immediately rushing out and buying. These, in some cases, these are, are serious drugs. Uh, metformin is a drug that uh, is metabolically active. It affects the way that you handle things like sugar in the body. These things are not without side effects, so you must be very cautious before doing anything like that. Aging is, at the moment, inevitability. We know there's nothing we can do about aging, but we can affect the rate at which it happens. Everyone ages, but we can make, in some cases, aging happen more quickly and aging happen more slowly. No one knows exactly why we are obliged to age at all, though. Why are the, the prote protection and repair mechanisms we have in the body not perfect? We don't know. But um, what we are quite good at is identifying what seems to make it happen more quickly and minimising those aspects in our life. And the best thing, the best thing you can do if you want to slow down the ageing process is not to smoke, actually. That has the most profound ageing effect on the body of almost anything that we have discovered. Oh, wow. On that note... And then I hope you're not suggesting then go to whiskey because that'll help you preserve. No, I did have a no. teacher once who had a, 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 a sign up in the classroom. I'm not sure that's the kind of message we'd send to kids these days. But it said, I look as young as I do because it just goes to show alcohol is an excellent preservative. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris, listen, we'll be in touch, man. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks, for Kino. Everything. It's and, been a blast. Uh, yeah. Certainly has been, man. It certainly has been. And uh, don't worry, I'll definitely be in touch.